listeners or chatters are solely the opinions of the original source who expressed them. They do not necessarily represent the opinions of Revolution Radio and freedomslips.com, its staff or affiliates. You're listening to Revolution Radio, freedomslips.com, 100% listener supported radio and now we return you to your host. <laughs> Hello, everyone. I'd like to welcome all of you back to Ohio Exopolitics. I'm your host, Mark Snyder, and it's very interesting to listen to that warm-up music. It's such a contrast to my show, which tends to be pretty mellow. Uh, Today, we're going to talk about the Billy Meyer case, particularly the difference between the spiritual consciousness and the material consciousness We're going to discuss self-similarity in nature and the patterns of nature. We're going to talk about Contact Report 10. We're going to introduce who Billy's third contact was, a woman named Simyase. We're going to talk about some topics from Billy's book called The Might of Thoughts. And some of those topics include Tangled Ideas, The Unvalues of the Psychopath, and in in Billy's book called Die Art zu Leben, or The Way to Live, we're going to talk about striving and what striving is and how that is destroyed. And then I think I'm going to segue into the creational natural laws and what those are. Edward Albert Meyer is an 81-year-old man who lives in Switzerland. He lives in a tiny mountain village about 40 minutes or so east of Zurich. He has written 65 books. He had his first extraterrestrial contacts back right around 1940, 1941, where his first physical contacts with a with a man named Svath. Svath was an extraterrestrial human, not a strange looking gray or uh, a reptilian. He wasn't a bird person, but he was a human being from a world much like ours, a world called Era, but he was not a Pleiadian. He was not from our Pleiades but he was from a world some 80 light years beyond our Pleiades in a different space-time configuration. So our universe is much older than what the scientists believe. It is 46 trillion years old, and it has seven different space-time configurations, and these are different dimensions but are not strange in any way they're very very similar with stars and planets and galaxies in them now the Pleiarum people are in an older space-time configuration than earth and they live many many light years from earth but they have technologies that enable them to not only traverse these incredible distances with almost no time passing but they can move between these different space-time configurations. Um, Our universe has seven concentric layers or circles, and six of those layers are what's called fine matter. They're not material. The fourth layer of our universe contains all the material for the galaxies, the stars, And that layer is further subdivided into seven different space-time configurations. Svath was a very old man. He was 900 and some years old. The Pleiaren have the normal lifespan for human beings, which is about a thousand years. Ours has been reduced on the Earth because of genetic manipulation that occurred, a genetic manipulation that was passed on to all the people of the Earth. Um, 
some subset of Earth humans come from the Cirrus system, where there was a group of extraterrestrial humans that were highly advanced in genetic engineering. And they altered the genes of a subset of their own race to live only 100 years and to have an increased aggression. So if you ever wonder why the Earth human has such an increased aggression, you'll be able to understand that now. It is part of our genetics. Now, it's something that can be overcome uh, through medical means, but also through spiritual teaching. If you recently saw the ultimate fighting championships between Conor McGregor and Habib, Habib Nurmagomedov, you will know that at the end of the fight, the fight went into the stands and spilled back into the octagon, and it was a brawl involving about 30 or 40 people. Now, to me, this is an indication of the situation that we're in on the earth. We are not living according to what are called the creational natural laws, and we'll get into more of that later. And we also have a genetic modification that's designed to enhance our aggression. So you see it in the conflicts now between the left and the right, between Antifa and, which is probably more of a terrorist organization than anything, and, and some of the far-right people. Uh, there are various riots occurring in our cities around the United States right now. Eventually, according to the Meyer information, this could lead to two civil wars in the United States and a time when our civilization will collapse. Our, our civilization is... There's a prophecy that says our civilization will collapse and that we'll have civil wars all through Europe. In the United States, there will be two civil wars. Our country will be broken up into five different areas. Now, if this doesn't happen, that's a good thing, and it's because of people like you that have listened to reasonable, intelligent discourse and have started to modify their thinking and modify their behavior. So I wanted to talk in the first 15 minutes here about the spiritual consciousness versus the material consciousness. And it's interesting because when I talk about Edward Albert Meyer and his extraterrestrial contacts with a man named Spock, those two were related or those two were affiliated with each other in previous lifetimes. The spirit form of Edward Albert Meyer is very ancient. It's 9.6 billion years old. The Meyer information, when it talks about Billy's spirit form, starts to refer to it using the term Nocodamian because that's one of the former personalities of Edward Albert Meyer. And Spoth, in some way, was associated with Nocodamian in the past. So he essentially elected to support Billy during the first, this first phase, this first 11 years of, of the mission. When Billy was about five years old, he started to get tel telepathic messages from Spoth. And eventually, over time, was directed to go out into the woods where Spoff landed in a clearing his strange silvery pear-shaped craft and took Edward Albert Meyer, a very young boy at this time, up into what you might call an uh, Earth orbit. And up there, one of the things that Spoff told Billy about was his previous lifetimes his former material consciousnesses, where he had been the people that today we call Enoch, Elijah, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Emmanuel, and Muhammad. And in each one of these lifetimes, he taught 
an ancient universal teaching, an Ur teaching. Ur is a prefix in the German which reform, refers to most, most ancient. So this, this teaching talks about the laws of the universe and how we can live according to these laws in such a way that it continually produces favorable circumstances in our life. Even it, during difficult times, it will produce favorable circumstances in our life because most of the circumstances in our life are related to our thinking. So Billy, at this point, is five or six years old. His material consciousness is. But his spiritual consciousness is 9.6 billion years old. Now, the spiritual consciousness impulses the material consciousness. Your spiritual consciousness is related to your spirit form. And the spirit form comes out of the spirit realm and into the body of a child at 21 days, when it's 21 days old. Now, the, the child is an embryo at this point. But when that spirit form comes in, it brings with it a new personality. And the new personality will be the material consciousness for this lifetime. So Billy's material consciousness for this lifetime is only f five years old or so at the time of his first meetings with Svath. The material consciousness is the creative thinking part of your consciousness. It's what writes books, what plays music, it, what does technical work even. The spirit form kind of sits in the background. The Geist form, as it's called in the German, it's also referred to to as a tell stock or a part piece of the universal consciousness. It can never be harmed. It's completely invulnerable. It will not go insane. It will, it will always be what's called neutral positive. It will be in harmony. This is the law of harmony. There's a bipolar structural composition to everything. There's a negative and a positive always. And the spiritual consciousness always remains in balance between the negative and the positive. It might be a slightly positive into a state we call neutral positive. Now the goal is to keep our material consciousness also in a neutral positive balance. Now how does that occur? Well the spirit form will impulse the material consciousness. And an impulse is a signal. So when you're doing something, you may be doing something that's perfectly neutral positive or you may be doing something that isn't. So if you're doing something that isn't right, you will get a thumbs down from the spirit form. Now, it doesn't articulate in the contact reports exactly how this happens, but my speculation is it goes something like this. The spirit form impulses the material consciousness through a signal. Now, the material consciousness picks this up unconsciously or subconsciously, and it generates a thought in the unconscious mind or the subconscious mind. And that thought will generate a feeling because according to the Meyer information, the feeling grows out of the thought. So you'll get an uncomfortable feeling if you're doing something that is not correct. Now this is a process that nature has put into place. I think most of us here on the earth are not using this and, and the very few that have are using it probably don't understand its significance. But this is kind of a, a built-in thermometer or a built-in indicator. Like the light that comes on your dashboard tells you you need air in your tires. So you get this uncomfortable feeling. You said something 
you've done something. Now you have this uncomfortable feeling. So if you think about that, if you're, if you're aware, if you're sensitive, you'll think, whoa, wow, maybe, maybe what I just said, maybe what I just thought wasn't the best thing that I could have done. Now, how do I know that this is the case? Well, I'll read from you something from Contact Report 10. This is Semyase, who is an, a player and woman. It's, she's really the main contact that most people know anything about for one reason or another. And this, this contact occurred on Wednesday, March 26th, about 3.20 p.m. in 1975. And I'll read for you just a few verses before the key verse. It says, Semyase said, The time has come to talk about things which are very important in connection with the consciousness and spiritual evolution of earth humans. For this reason, I do not wish to respond to any questions at this time unless they relate directly to this discourse. Please understand. The human bears the spirit that does not die nor sleep during the deepest sleep of the human. It records all things, all thoughts and emotions. It informs the human whether his thoughts are correct or false, if he's learned to pay attention. So that's what I'm talking about. This is something that stuck in my mind as I was reading this, even reading it the first time. Now it's very interesting because Semyase says, the human bears a spirit. Now, later, when I read this the first time, I didn't know that the spirit here is the Geist form in the German. The Geist form is a German term that tells us about the part of you that never dies. You know, when you die, physically, your body starts to decay fairly soon after your death, your, your material consciousness goes dormant. So let me just say that those people that think they're talking to the dead, they're not really talking to who they think they're talking to. In other words, there's a when people think they're talking to the dead, and I don't know much about this, I haven't studied in great detail, but something goes on that's akin to procreation. And a spirit is somehow generated. So a person is talking to a spirit. Um, I'll have to look that up and give you more detail at some other time. But it's not, it's not the person that you think you're talking to because what happens when the spirit form, the geist form, leaves the body the physical realm, it takes the consciousness with it, and it goes into the spirit realm. The consciousness at this point, the material consciousness, it has no brain, it's, it's basically gone dormant, it's being put in a storage bank called the overall consciousness block. And this overall consciousness block working with the spirit form goes through a, a lengthy review process that pulls out everything that you've learned and creates these essences, like the essence of, of the logic that you've learned, the essence associated with your sense of confidence and optimism and uh, your sense of responsibility, all these different virtues that you've developed over time, if you did develop virtue at, at, during your previous life, and those essences are stored in the spirit form, and they're also programmed into the subconsciousness. And your personality during this process is dissolved. So although you, the information associated with your material consciousness is stored in the spirit form, it's also stored in the new subconsciousness which is created, and it's also somehow deposited in the universal storage banks. There's no one up there that you can have a discourse with at this time. It's kind of like your car is in the shop and all the pieces are taken apart. This is, this is kind of what happens in the spirit realm. 
Because everything is getting prepared for the new lifetime. And this process should take about 152 years if you've lived 100 years. So it's about a lifetime and a half to do this. Now, unfortunately, in the time that we live, that we don't get enough time in the spirit realm. And it's because of the overpopulation. And overpopulation is a real problem for a lot of different reasons on the earth. So I don't really, I don't, I guess I will take a slight segue into this if I can. I, I just want to talk about what, ha what is happening on the, on the, on the other side in the spirit realm and what's sometimes called the fine matter world. So I said, again, if a person lived 100 years under I ideal conditions, you'd go 152 years. Um, what we have now because of overpopulation, we have incarnations of new personalities, and these are premature incarnations. In other words, there's not enough time in the spirit realm to program the next personality. And this leads to an instability of personality. This is a big problem now because people are coming in and they've got problems because of the imbalance between the spirit realm and, and the material world. Um, if a person hasn't had enough time, the spirit form hasn't had enough time to... Uh, absorb all the information from the previous life and hasn't had enough time to create the new personality. A person, the person that's born tends to need more support from their parents. A lot of times the masculinity doesn't also have enough time to form. That's why we, there are other reasons that this is occurring too, I'm sure, but that's why we see so many males today um, that are born particularly some of these young uh, men, and when I mean, they could be 13, 14 years old, and they're kind of androgynous. They're, they're, I mean, you can tell that they're a male, just kind of, but you're not absolutely certain. And then part of this is because of overpopulation. I think there are other things that are contributing too. But, and once these cycles get into a bad state, Things never return to normal on a planet. Even if you reduced your population to 500 million or whatever, this imbalance to a degree is still there because now you have too many spirit forms activated. Currently, there's 129 billion spirit forms in the fine material realm around our planet. This is way too many uh, spirit forms to have on a planet our size or on pretty much any planet that I can think of. So another thing that I'll just step talk about just briefly is is the fine fluidal energies. Now your spirit form and your material consciousness I think work together to perform create these fine fluidal energies. And they're almost like a memory of sorts. The fine fluid energies, for example, if a person uh, dies and, 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 and they leave their heart to be transplanted into another human being, the other human being will be affected by the fine fluid energies of the heart of the original donor. And suddenly this person that's getting the heart transplant is going to have completely thoughts that they've never had before and uh, it, uh, there was one case where I, I heard where uh, a, a woman was murdered and her heart was then given a, as a donor to someone else who then started to have dreams of being murdered 
and and they, and they were so vivid. The dreams were so vivid that the police actually caught the murderer. So, the fine fluidal forces are these electromagnetic vibrations. Every person emits these electromagnetic vibrations because of their thinking. Have you ever come in contact with a person and got a really bad vibe, or you come in contact with a person and you get a really good vibe? Well, if you're getting a good vibe, it's like two pebbles that are cast into a, a pond and the rings come out, and they're the same exact vibration, and the, and the, and the two enhance each other. But on the other hand, you can have a person that you just don't jive with because of these fine fluidal forces. Your clothing and your watches and the walls of your house will absorb these energies. And it's very, very good, just as kind of a side note, not to destroy your skeleton. After death, do not allow yourself to be cremated because there's some subconscious way that we make a back connection to the previous life. And it can be very, very helpful. I'm, I don't know much more about it than that. So you're going to have, if you're a typical person, you're going to have 40 to 60 million years of reincarnating into physical bodies. Under ideal time, under ideal circumstances, you would spend about 18 million years in physical life, and the rest of that 60 to 40 million year time would be spent in the spirit realm. That's the first five stages of evolution. And, you know, it's. I think what's one of the problems on Earth is we we don't have a uniform evolution. In other words, we have people that are Aboriginal in Australia that are in the first stage of evolution. They're totally primitive. We have other people that are in rational life, which is probably the majority of the planet, which is stage two of, of human evolution. And the stage three of evolution is intelligent life. And we have a small, small percentage of our population there. But, for example, the Playaren, their population is in the fourth and fifth stages of evolution. So they, they have starships that can fly from star to star with almost no time passing. Uh, their ships have biological intelligence. Their central computers are self-aware. Uh, this is technology that boggles our mind, but eventually we're going to we're going to build things like this. Um, you know, some of these ships, I believe, they can pass right through physical material. And somehow, you know, if you look at the atom, scientists, some scientists say that the atom is like a, a little whirlwind. It's almost like a mini tornado. And you touch something and it feels solid. What you're bumping up against is like, the wall of force from that mini tornado, not actual physical matter. I mean, the physical matter supposedly of the human body is probably very, very small. I mean, very, very tiny. So that's why the the old sages of the past were said to sometimes be able to walk through walls and stuff. Well, because of the just the pure power of their thought, they're able to affect the way their atoms, I guess, are resonating in a way, the way the spin takes place. And they, and they go out of phase with our reality and they can walk right through a wall. Well, it's the same with these ships. They do the same thing. They can go right into a mountain. And it makes me think of the Giza intelligences because their ship went far below the Giza plateau. And it's in a hall down there, or it was. I don't think it is anymore. And, and Billy, you know, took a trip with his second extraterrestrial teacher, and they went far below the Giza Plateau and saw this gigantic spacecraft that I believe was 300, 300 meters. It was gigantic. So 
we here on the earth are, are rather backward in our understanding. And there's a reason for that. And that's what we're going to talk about during the second hour and how our striving has been destroyed by, by religions. But I, I talked at length there for the, for 30 minutes or so, but I didn't, I didn't articulate quite as much as I wanted to on the material consciousness. Remember your material consciousness is your personality in this lifetime. It is your conscious mind, your subconscious mind, your unconscious mind. Your spirit form is not completely aware. It's just focused on recording everything, the purest information, while your material consciousness is living and being creative and learning. And your spirit form is also impulsing your material consciousness to help keep you on the right path. Um, so that is the difference between the material consciousness and the spiritual consciousness. The material consciousness can be harmed. Your material consciousness can become a megalomaniac and a psychopath. So the much of the spiritual teaching is designed on training the material consciousness. And it's not just learning, it's training, meaning that you are being trained you're developing habits, just like a uh, a martial artist repeats things or a musician repeats things over and over and over again. So it becomes second nature. It's the same way with the spiritual teaching. Now, one of the things that Semyase, and we'll talk in a little more detail about who Semyase was, and well, maybe I'll just go into this right now. Uh, Billy had... 11 years of contacts with Svath, and I just briefly introduced Svath again. And then once Billy had turned, oh, I'm trying to think his age, I think it was 15 or 16, he then had his second teacher, a woman named Askit from the Tao Universe. She's the one that took him below the Great Pyramids, and he learned more about religion and some of the negative ETs. And then after those 11 years, Billy had 11 years of, an, I guess what you could call a somewhat normal life. He married, had children, moved back to Switzerland. And then right around the mid-1970s, uh, a woman named Semyase started to have contacts with him. And she would land her ship right there in Switzerland and the daylight out in the open, it was pretty amazing in the summertime and, and spring even. Uh, and then Billy would have to drive his moped out there and wait. And then she would eventually come out of her ship. She was 344 years old. She was a slender, young, pretty woman, uh, light blonde hair, somewhat forward placed earlobes. Her earlobes were a little longer than the typical earth human. That's probably the on, only distinguishing feature, uh, the main anatomical difference that she had with, with earth women. Uh, besides that, generally, she looked exactly like an earth woman. She had an incredible exceptional knowledge, and which exceeds far more than most of her population. She was halfway to what's called an Ishrish, or a queen of wisdom. She had mastered several occupations, and she was concerned with what was happening on the earth. She only mastered German in terms of the earth languages, and that was because it's, it's a superior language in terms of the ability to communicate. Um, it's very interesting that Semyase is an ancient Lyrian term that means demigoddess. And so, it, it, very, very interesting. She had contacts with Billy for um, 
three or four years, but on December 15th of 1977, she suffered a life-threatening accident at the Semyasi Silver Star Center. And one of the other people there at the center walked in on her and Billy. And the thought vibrations, for lack of a better word, of the play are, are very, very highly advanced. And they're very different. You notice I talked about, you ever been around anyone when they give you bad vibes, okay? That's because the resonant frequency of the other person and you are incompatible. And I think I've been around people, I don't know this for sure, that either were criminals or murderers and it's like whoa you come up against them and you're like wow man i can't wait to get away from that person well that's the reaction times 10 that semyase had when this individual walked into the room on billy and it any earth human would have had that effect on her it wasn't that this person was particularly bad i think his name was Jacobus, and Literally, when this happens, the playaran typically would wear some electronic protective gear to, to protect them from the thought vibrations of Earth peoples. And that's one of the reasons, too, they don't have open contact with us. There are many good reasons. We would worship them still today. We would drop our entire, everything we're doing in our life. If you were to come up against one of these extraterrestrials like Svath, like Semyase, like Askit, or some of the others like Ptah, you would drop everything in your life and you would follow them like a little puppy dog. You wouldn't go to your you wouldn't go to your work. You would just you your whole life you would totally devote yourself to the spiritual teachings or whatever. You would be so overwhelmed with this vibration because it has a higher level of happiness associated with it. Well, the same by the same token, all the negativity of the normal earth human like Jacobus was absorbed by Semyase at that one point and she collapsed and she hit her head and she was eventually transported to her ship. Well, it took quite some time for her to recover from this and I'll read to you here on February 3rd, 1984, the last conversation took place between Semyase and Billy as an after effect of her accident on the 15th of December, 1977. She suffered a cerebral collapse in the beginning of November, 1984, and was transported again as quickly as possible to the Tao universe, which is our sister universe, which is where Askit is from. Uh, she was transported to the Tao universe where she was healed by the help of Askit and her friends, the Sonar. Now, the Sonar, the S-O-N-A-E-R, are very interesting extraterrestrials. Don't know much about them. They do not require any ships to travel through space and time. How that works, I don't know, but I guess that's some aspect of telekinesis. So there, there are good reasons to keep evolving. There are a lot of, a lot of things become better through evolution. Now, well, I won't get off on any more tangents. I was, I was going to take us off on another tangent, but I, but I want to move to this concept called self-similarity in nature, just briefly. A self-similar object is, if you divide it, it looks, the, the part looks just like the whole. Snowflakes are kind of like that. Uh, coastlines are said to be that way to a degree. So uh, fractals are that way. It's a pattern in nature. There are trees, spirals. Uh, so we see that I think fractals would be another self-similar thing. Now the reason I bring this up is because 
Semyase, one of the things she said was the human was the microcosm within the macrocosm. So everything related to all of the universe was within the human. And I've often wondered what that meant. And I think it, it refers to self-similarity. Let me continue here. It says... That's why the terrestrial philosophers of old spoke about the human as a microcosm within a macrocosm because everything that is contained within the universe is also contained within the human. Now that, you know, that would lead to a lot of speculation on my part. And maybe, you know, in my next lifetime I'll know a little bit more about that. But I think it has something to do with creations material immaterial aspect in other words the spirit within us is a part piece of this universal consciousness so the spirit is said to be the wonder of all wonders and that our spirit form is a fragment of this whole incredible universal consciousness. So in that sense, we're a microcosm within a macrocosm. So let me read just a little bit from Contact Report 10. It says, Joy comes forth from the human's inner part created by spiritual and consciousness-based poise. So one of the things that we're learning in Billy's books is a poise, a consciousness-based poise that comes from learning the material consciousness, learning how to have neutral, positive, harmonious thoughts. Therefore, everything comes from within. The things that, or humans who seemingly form the cause of happiness are only the external occasion to bring happiness within the human expressing itself. If he has worked towards this in a consciousness-based manner. So as you learn to stay neutral positive under different circumstances, it brings you this spiritual poise, consciousness-based poise, and it brings within it a happiness. And the creation, the universal consciousness, has the same happiness. Endless happiness, it's said to have endless power, are included in this existence. So, you may be 50 years old, you may be 60 years old, but your spirit shows no signs of old age. The spirit... Is it's never angry, it's never sad, it's always neutral positive. And the, the goal is to train the material consciousness to have this kind of wisdom. And if you do, then you'll start to have happiness and balance and harmony. So that's what we're kind of shooting for. in the spiritual teaching. So I think I'll move into one of Billy's books. Billy has a lot of very interesting books. I'm looking at a book now called The Psyche. And this is the book that he recommends you read first. It will teach you about your psyche to begin with. You have a factor... The psyche is, he calls it, a, the block which controls the thoughts and feelings of your material consciousness. And the material consciousness is what you will be training and learning, teaching this lifetime. You have something called your spiritual consciousness. And what controls the spiritual consciousness is something called the gemut. The gemut controls the thoughts and feelings of the spiritual consciousness. But your spiritual consciousness is never harmed. It's always in neutral, positive balance, 
just like the universal consciousness. So the book, The Psyche, is a great book for learning terminology, and I think it takes a long time to really understand what is in this book. It did for me anyway. So the material consciousness, through various circumstances and occurrences, can become ill. It can become feeble-minded. It can become confused. So let's talk about confusion for just a second. Because confusion occurs and can have some disastrous results in your life if you have confusion. And one of the things we want to avoid most of all is confusion. And on page 224 of the Might of Thoughts, it says, in regard to your confusion, it says here, this is a contrast to entangled ideas, confuse the thoughts, and abruptly go from one extreme to another, whereby a misdirection of thoughts arises, which triggers emotions, which can lead to murder and manslaughter. Now again, I go back to my analogy in the Ultimate Fighting Championships, where, in this case, Habib Nurmagomedov jumps over out of the octagon and attacks someone who was who was a, another Brazilian jiu-jitsu person who was in Conor McGregor's camp who was taunting him. So we tend to lose all control of our thoughts under these. This is the ultimate worst thing that can happen. So first of all, tangled ideas confuse the thoughts. What are ideas? The, the Meyer case talks about ideas as being un undeveloped factors, undeveloped thoughts, unripe concepts. In other words, you haven't completely thought these things through. Habib didn't think through the ramifications of jumping over the octagon and attacking a person in the stands, regardless of whether they were a trained fighter, which they were. But what happens is we start to do things completely impulsively when we have tangled ideas. So people get caught up in, in ideas that are incorrect, and they can't free themselves from them. And notice that when you have tangled ideas, your thoughts are not organized. Ideas are tangled. This results in a kind of frantic behavior. Have you ever known anyone that was lost, confused, unclear, perplexed? Well, your tangled ideas will confuse your thoughts, and your thoughts will then become abrupt it will go from one extreme to another. It will cause a misdirection of thoughts, which will trigger emotions, which can lead to manslaughter and murder. So this is the down-to-earth part of the Meyer material that keeps you from destroying your whole life, where you could literally let tangled ideas. What are tangled ideas again? Uh, the term tangled means twisted together, untidy, matted. So think back. I'm sure you've had a few times where you were frantic. You may have even attacked a person that said something to you that attacked. You may attack a person that attacked one of your loved ones. Well, you may have, have had confused, jumbled, mixed up, messy, chaotic thoughts at this time. This causes confusion. Um, it confuses the thoughts. When we're confused, we are unable to think clearly. Let me, let me talk about the importance of thinking clearly. The Meyer material in the Might of Thoughts says that we need to learn to nurture our thoughts, to strengthen our thoughts, to clarify our thoughts. When we do that, the confusion goes out. What is confusion? Confusion is when boundaries are blurred and when you can't distinguish one category of something from another. 
You know, if you get emotionally charged enough, you'll also lose the ability for linear thinking. Sometimes this will happen when a person is in college and they come to a portion of the test and they read a question in there and it kind of goes into a state of panic because they don't remember anything from this particular question. And if they let their emotions get carried away, it will destroy you the whole ability to think. So you want to have order in your consciousness. You want to have clear linear thinking. So take time in your day to sort out your thoughts. One of the best ways to do this is I repeat to myself, I'm confident, I'm optimistic, I'm relaxed, I'm cheerful, I'm enthusiastic, I'm in harmony. I do not allow my thoughts to drift. I steer my thoughts like a captain steers his ship. I nurture my thoughts. I strengthen my thoughts. I clarify my thoughts. I'm the master of my own destiny, the forger of my own fortune, the creator of my own good luck. Take time. First of all, get this book. Order it from Michael Horn. Get this book. Start to read it. You might have to read the psyche first. Now, the Meyer material is not a quick fix. It takes a lot of time to go through this stuff and to really learn these skills. There's no, there is no quick fix. It's a lot of effort. It's a lot of dedication. It takes a lot of time. It takes months. It takes years. When you first start to read the mind of thoughts, you'll understand very, very little. In fact, you might have to read it a couple times before you understand much, anything at all. And then when you start to read it again and again, you'll start to realize that if you read a, a paragraph or just a couple sentences, you can spend the rest of the day thinking about what that says. Let me, let me, let me go back to what we're talking about here. This is in contrast to entangled ideas confused with thoughts. So this will cause the thoughts to go from one extreme to another, like love to hate. How many times have you been in an argument with a loved one where you just went off the deep end? You lost, you know, you're yelling and you're, you know, the last thing you want to do is yell at a loved one, but you do it. Why? Well, because you have tangled ideas which have confused your thoughts. And this causes a misdirection of the thoughts and it triggers emotions. And if you don't stop this behavioral pattern, if you don't nip it in the bud, it can lead to murder and manslaughter. A lot of people have killed people just because they've gotten their thoughts out of control. And what happens is you lose virtue and rationality. There's no room in your consciousness for this. You have virtuelessness that starts to govern your consciousness and if you stay in this state of mind you know a lot of times you'll have an elevated um, heart rate you have adrenaline and you can't focus your thoughts and you cannot set a clear intellectual goal you cannot set a life determination under this state you cannot even imagine uh, Idea, certain concepts become foreign to you. You can only generate the incomplete idea, which is not completed. It's, an, it's not an ideal with an L. You get trapped by these. You know, your adrenaline's racing, your heart rate's up, you're angry. You know, you've, you've succumbed to an emotion. And if you feel yourself do that, tell yourself you're confident. Because most of the time, underneath all this, you felt threatened. And you're striking out because you felt that. Tell yourself you're optimistic, you're relaxed, you're cheerful. So when you get calmed down a little bit, you can start to thoroughly contemplate your ideas, which are incomplete, which are unright. And you can turn the idea, I-D-E-A-S, into an I-D-E-A-L, which is complete. 
One of the things that's very important at this point to do is recognize the values and unvalues in your ideas. An unvalue, and, I, and, I've, and I've experienced this myself, an unvalue is something that really has no value except to you. In other words, you've adopted a wrong form of thinking as your modus operandi. And it can take months or even years to unprogram yourself. People that have addictions, whether it's sex, whether it's alcohol, tobacco, gambling, they have unvalues. In other words, they behave in ways that they don't even want to do. Particularly sad about this would be I, the gambler that gambles us all of his money away. He doesn't want to do that, but he has an unvalue that can require months or even years to change for the better. So we have to change our life so that it is directed toward evolutive striving, not directed towards fulfilling things like addictions. We'll be back in five minutes, folks. Thanks. Travels to Earth through the rainbow crystal bubbles from the furthest reaches of space and time, across the dimensions, through the elements, and in harmony with the colors of the universe. Through her mastery of abstract stream of consciousness malapropisms, she weaves a web of comic, satiric, cosmic conversation. Her subjects can range from Norman, the goose next door, to astrology and Earth changes and into the deep recesses of the soul matrix. She holds a wealth of knowledge on herbs, plants, and astrology. Join Mona and her guests on Adventures of a Feral Hippie as she touches the earthly radio waves five days a week at 2 p.m. Monday to Friday on Studio B at Revolution Radio. Sending time and space, let us take you to the place inside your mind where thoughts divide and mysteries unwind. Join us every Monday evening right here on Revolution Radio at freedomslips.com from 8 to 10 p.m. Eastern Time. And you will catch the Fenton Perspective with our great host, Lorian Fenton. Come listen in as she shares her amazing stories from the past to present, along with all of her guest secrets to the future. That's the Fenton Perspective every Monday evening right here from 8 to 10 p.m. Eastern Time, only on Revolution Radio. Oh, and uh, you don't need to expect us. We're already here. Are we? Where do we come from? Are you curious about the origins of the human race? 
Join me, Gavin McCall, and a variety of guests on Ancient Humans, where we decipher world events, explore scientific theories, personal stories, myths, mysteries, and lore about the history of the human race. Hi, everybody. It's me, the Fedge, host of Inside the Eye Live. Before the Sunday mainstream media political pundit talk shows, there is Inside the Eye Live, where we break down some of the weekly mainstream media talking points before the talking points even get aired. Add in some entertaining stories, weather, cats, intriguing and informative guests, and you get one of the most listened to Saturday morning streaming media political talk shows going today. And it's all right here on our flagship station, Revolution Radio at freedomslips.com. So join me, the Fetch, for Inside the Eye Live every Saturday morning at 10 o'clock a.m. Eastern. It is truly intelligent media for the politically aware. The opinions expressed on this radio station, its programs, and its website by the hosts, guests, and call-in listeners or chatters are solely the opinions of the original source who expressed them. They do not necessarily represent the opinions of Revolution Radio and FreedomSlips.com, its staff, or affiliates. You're listening to Revolution Radio, FreedomSlips.com, 100% listener-supported radio, and now we return you to your host. Hello, everyone. I'd like to welcome all of you back. Uh, this is Ohio Exopolitics, and I'm your host, Mark Snyder. We are talking about the Billy Meyer case, and Billy Meyer is an 81-year-old man from Switzerland. He has written 65 books. These books include The Psyche, The Way to Live, The Might of Thoughts, uh, another book called The Goblet of Truth, and these books are very interesting. They talk about the creational natural laws, and one of those laws is love. And last, last hour we were talking about how tangled ideas can confuse the thoughts and cause them to go abruptly from one extreme to another, which can trigger emotions and can lead to manslaughter and murder. Well, one of the things we have to do is continually clarify our thoughts. So what you're doing is you're also trying to develop your ideas, I-D-E-A-S, develop them into ideals, I-D-E-A-L-S, so that you can get these complete concepts which are not unvalues. Now, in Figu Bulletin, Billy has a group, it's called Figu. It's headquartered in Switzerland, but there's a Figu Canada and a Figu Australia. There's not an official Figu in the United States, but there are a lot of study groups. But there are people all over the world that are studying this material, and the Figu group puts out a bulletin. And this is a bulletin, special bulletin number 68, which talks about a conversation that Billy had with one of these extraterrestrials uh, named Pata. And Pata was talking about unvalues, which are characteristics of psychopaths. So let me, let me just cover a couple, couple of these. <laughs> they are... They're, they're rather lengthy. A lack of logical decisions, a lack of rational conduct, irresponsible activity, frequent change of sexual partner, pathological lying, mendacity, making untenable promises, breaking them, exaggerated thoughts and feeling with regard to one's own person, uh, a feigned charm, boredom, which I've always thought was interesting, I think that's a challenge we go through as kids. 
in our th- think in our thinking. Deceitful behavior is another unvalue of the psychopath. Parasitism, being a parasite, scrounging off of others. Deficiency with gar- with regard to real and long-term results in many forms and whys. Manipulative behavior. Have you ever? Do you have any family that? try to manipulate you that are calling you for money it's very strange um, I'm, I'm not going to go any farther there uh, a selfish lifestyle being dazzling uh, you know people that have unvalues usually don't have much of a a consciousness in terms of their own guilt they have difficulty in behavioral control they have they don't ponder things they may have a pathological craving oh you know that that really triggers something and I'm gonna jump ahead a little bit and this is in Billy's book the way to live keep that in mind a pathological craving maybe I don't know if I'll be able to find the exact place that was talking about this now this is one of the very controversial aspects of the Meyer case. And he talks in negative terms about our religions here on the earth. And he says here, well, let me just start out with this. It says here, through this religious sectarian irrational teaching, every believer's Creational, natural, innate striving for that which is higher and the highest possible absolutely full development is throttled and even eliminated. So what Billy is saying is that the religions on the earth, they take away our inborn, innate desire to strive. Striving is a creational natural law. You can't have happiness without striving. If you're going through a time of great unhappiness, it might be that you need to really crank up your striving during this time in your life. And this can be as simple as organizing and cleaning out your garage if you happen to be unfortunately laid off or whatever. You can always strive. Striving is its part of the innate nature of the human being. It's part of our nature to strive. And Billy is saying religions undermine that. Let me continue here. It says, if the human being lacks striving, then he or she no longer finds and recognizes any zeal, a life direction towards which it would be rewarding to work and to live. In other words, you do not have Religions tend to undermine our natural urge to strive. He or she becomes dependent on religious, sectarian, wrong philosophical, philosophical, irrational teaching and dogmas, which every normal human rational being recognizes as absurd. You know, I don't want to knock religion at all. Um, the Meyer material teaches that there is a universal consciousness and that it's what they call in the German a Wesenheit. It's a living being with a super intelligence, but it's neither good nor evil. It's not a father figure. It's not a mother figure. It has no personality. It's neutral. And it creates human spirit forms as a part of its own evolution. So your boots on the ground for the creation. You're going to go through seven evolutionary steps and eventually merge back with creation and bring all your experiences and knowledge with it back to creation. Now, this is different than a god. There is no god in the sense that the religions teach. You are responsible for everything that you think, for everything that you do, And, for example, 60 million people killed in World War II. That was allowed. If we destroy this planet, I'm not so sure that there will be any extraterrestrials that 
would 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 get in the way and and stop that from happening. Uh, there's certainly, if you look at 60 million people killed, I guess roughly in World War II, that is not a father figure. That's not a heavenly father. Um, a father intervenes to save the child, and the, we have a neutral positive super intelligence which which radiates love not the love that we're used to normally thinking of and the religions have misunderstood this and they've created dogmas that undermine our whole thinking process so let me continue here it says to be a believer means to be without striving to no longer have any initiative in regard to natural advancement. So religions will undermine your initiative. Now, I, I wish I knew more about how that happens because I experienced that in my life as well. I didn't understand it at the time. But I think what it, it makes you is more and more dependent instead of becoming independent. Because the spiritual teaching, as it's described, is designed to make you independent. In other words, you're responsible for everything that you think, for everything that you do. And your thoughts have an incredible power. So, it is the nature of the thoughts that by their might alone, every conceivable thing can be brought into fruition. And there is a universal law called the universal creation law that says thoughts enlivened by might and power will have an effect. And that effect is directly proportional to the might and the power of the thought. So you are very, very, very powerful. You're not weak. You're not dependent. You're not a sheep. So... If you take in these religious dogmas, it will interrupt your natural advancements. And you will no longer achieve your natural evolution. And you'll, your striving will be undermined. And you will start to stagnate. And you will start to wither. Dogmas destroy the striving of the human being. You will become powerless and incapable of living. That's the one thing I, I you know, you you know, in for example in Christianity, uh, we're taught what some people might call faith rest, or you claim a promise of God and and you repeat this promise over and over in your mind, and it can cause you to have some um, a sense of relaxation and peace. So, you know, I I, I do not um, attack religion in that sense. But it never gets you from point A to point B because you're always um, powerlessness in the sense that you're depending psychologically on this creator God. And what's really in our universe is what's called a Wesenheiten, a neutral, positive superintelligence that radiates love that is not going to interfere in your life that is not going to circumvent you solving your own problems. What you have to learn is that your own thinking is so powerful and that you have the ability to affect things that you never thought you could. So if you become a believer in dogmas, you will no longer be able to make your way alone and independently. You will lose your individuality, and he or she, as it says here, he or she withers into a dog, dogma-directed herd animal. Have you seen the uh, religious shows where people, uh, they, they start to develop this herd behavior where they're, you know, raising their hands and swinging back and forth? It's really sad. Which, for better or worse, is in bondage to the master. Or he or she withers into the non-viable and into the outcast, outsider, whose life consists 
of murderous or criminal deeds. And this is what got me over here because we were talking about the psychopath and his unvalues. Now listen, this is and and this is going to be worthy of some study on my part. But Billy, I'm going to read what Billy says here. Here she withers into the non viable outcast outsider whose life consists of murderous or criminal deeds or uncontrollable pathological cravings, vices, irrationality, and delusional assumptions. That uncontrollable pathological craving is really hit home. That was, I think, what happens to most people in involved in religions is they they develop un, uncontrollable pathological craving there's something about striving and thinking independently and getting an understanding of your own power that will take away the pathological craving in other words you go from ideas these unright things to ideals and it's the only thing I found I can I can remember um, being involved in in religion like that, and um, it's you're very prone to negative thinking. I, I will say that very very prone. Um, human beings who do not understand and do not fulfill their own striving for that which is higher are chronic sufferers. And, um, you know, what does Billy say about suffering? He says, um, as a rule, um, suffering is an effect of wrong thinking. So if you have wrong thinking, particularly where it's related to negative outcomes, um, you'll have suffering. And, and incidences of suffering are indicators that the law of harmony has been um, ignored. So, there are some creational natural laws which I haven't talked to or talked about in a while, so let me repeat those. The first is the law of love. Love refers to the highest form of love. It's known as effective love. Then there's the law of striving which is the fundamental law of all evolution. Without striving, there is no life. That's what we were talking about. Now, the law of harmony says that we've got a neutral positive thoughts. The law of harmony says there's a negative and a positive to everything. Uh, and this is something that isn't in my notes. My notes are behind here. It's, there is um, the universal law of creation that says that thoughts enlivened by might and power will have an effect and that that effect is directly proportional to the might and power of the thoughts there's also something called the law of prosperity and abundance that we have the opportunity to have abundance and and everything that we need the biggest threat to that right now is because we are living in a gigantic overpopulation um, Earth-like planets like ours should have about 500 million people on them. So those are just some of the creational natural laws. Um, the challenge is doing them, not, not, not knowing them, but really living and doing them all the time. So, the law of striving. I, I told you what happens if you... that your sense of life lies in your striving. And if you don't strive, you will have all sorts of bad... or if you don't strive enough, there are times in your life, I believe, where we have to intensify our striving. Striving leads to satisfaction. To be without striving means unwillingness and affliction. So we really have to 
focus on striving as much as possible and evolving. Now, unfortunately, there are some very evil people in the world right now. And there is a group Billy calls the Secret Dark Order, which is trying to engineer a third world war. And they want a world government, which would dictate all policy in every country. They want a world central bank, which would dictate global finance. They want a world currency. There'd be no physical money, just entries in a com computer. They want a microchipped population. This sometimes is called the New World Order. Um, the symbol is the eye in the pyramid. Um, so this is, I think, what's going on in the United States right now. The deep state are behind this New World Order. And it's, it's very interesting to, to stand back a little bit because I think the New World Order may be somehow related to the Giza intelligences. You know, I've talked about the, the Giza intelligences before. They were uh, a playaren, a group of the playaren that didn't follow the creational natural laws that we've been talking about. And they got involved in our religions. And we have these religions on the earth, which has ha have had a, a very, very deleterious effect on us over time. But the Billy calls them the secret dark order. They, they want to control the money. They want to control the power. They, I believe, are in control of our third, uh, I, I guess it would be called um, the, the media. Let's call it the, the mainstream media anyway. anyway. And, uh, and, you, and you notice so many people now that are being programmed by the mainstream media. What did the elites want for the people of Earth? They want a world government, a cashless society, something called the Orwellian state. And the Orwellian state is, George Orwell wrote a book. I, I could never stand reading it all. It was so depressing. They want a microchip population. Billy has talked about the microchip population in in. Figu Bulletin 2. Uh, we've also, Billy has talked about what's called the, the DSP, or the Deep Space Platform, which is a whole series of satellites which are observing everything that we, we do. I believe, I don't think Billy's ever said this, but I know that Dr. Greer says that some of these satellites have weapons on them that target extraterrestrial ships. So there's there's a lot of strange stuff going on in the world that we don't know about. The elites want a world central bank. They want a world army. And the, there's a certain group, I say it's about half of the world's population, that is very, very vulnerable to the programming that's coming out of the mainstream media. And what's been a surprise to me is that intelligent people are vulnerable to this. Um, I would think that it, it's so transparent to me, it's so obvious to me um, that, we're, that people are being programmed. So there's a, there was something called the, the Project for the New American Century, and these were a group of neocons like Donald Rumsfeld, Dick Cheney, Paul Wolfowitz, that had a plan basically to conquer the world. And they wanted to uh, attack and take over Iraq. We saw the Iraq War. They did that. We, 
We, they want to attack Libya and Syria, which is what we're seeing now. They want to have war with China. This is absolutely insane. We, they wanted to go into Afghanistan, which they did. We have also have Lebanon, Somalia, and Sudan. That, that is part of their plan. General Wesley Clark talked about this. He said that a few days after 9-11, he met with a military officer he knew, and that said that this officer said that we were going to war with Iraq, and that was the Iraq war. You know, it'd be very interesting to have Billy go over this sort of thing in more detail. Because the New World Order, you can trace back at least to Albert Pike, who had a vision of World War III back in the late 1800s. So this Albert Pike had this vision, which he wrote about. And these elite have been planning the next World War. I don't know whether we should call it World War IV or what. Um, but this is what's being planned in the background. So we're in a very, very, very dangerous time here on the Earth. Um, and we've seen Contact Report 215, which actually I've, I've talked about recently on the show. And one of the startling things about Contact Report 215, and a lot of this we, we, we just kind of read past, and we don't really listen to what it's saying, because in Contact Report 215, it says that, I believe that our civilization will collapse. I think it says this right around line 208. And let me read that. This is, the cruel happenings will last about 888 days and cause civilization to collapse. Now, these prophecies may or may not happen. I'm hoping that there will be enough activity among the people in Figu that we can thwart this. But it says that the terrible scenario will continue and epidemics and various diseases, an enormous famine will spread among the people, the economy of the world will totally collapse, and there will be no possibility to produce any goods. You know, this, this is a situation which it's very difficult for me to, to wrap my mind around that actually happening. The things that have woke me up have been the hurricanes and the fires and, and that have continually come, become worse and worse and worse every year. And now we're starting to see the social unrest. I was talking about the, the great fight that broke out here in the Ultimate Fighting Championships. Um, but we're seeing riots in various cities all over our country as the left and the right um, fight against each other. So it's uh, very, very challenging to, to keep all of this in your mind and to to really understand it it says that we will have civil war in Spain Russia and Sweden are talked about in contact report 215 and I think we're starting to see some of that now it says here that France and Spain will become involved with each other in armed conflicts and even before World War three will have broken out Yet France will not only engage in armed conflicts with Spain, for within her great unrest will arise, leading to upheavals and civil war, as will be the case in Russia and Sweden. So we're going to have civil war in Russia, civil war in Sweden as well. Two civil wars in the United States and that will break us up into five different areas. Um, and I'm not trying to generate fear, just awareness, because I think we, we, I know I do, I become kind of of the point of view that things are always going to continue along the lines that they're, that they're currently in. And that evidently is not the case. Well, things are going to get crazy if, and if we, unless we have a, a real change in our thinking. 
So we'll have civil war in Germany. We'll have civil war in England, Wales, and Northern Ireland, or conditions similar to civil war. Um, Russia will eventually attack the state of Alaska and Canada. And there will be this conflict against the U.S. and Canada, I think, will be working together to fight against Russia. But it could be a, th a three-way conflict. I don't know. But there will be at that time nuclear, biological, and chemical weapons that are used in mass. That means in a group. That means all together. Now we've seen the rolling walls of fire, which are said to that will rage across the United States. It says here, as already mentioned, enormous natural catastrophes and rolling walls of fire. And violent hurricanes will rage across America, while in addition all the terrible effects of war will bring thousandfold death, destruction, and annihilation. Now, there have always been some fires in the West, nothing like we're seeing now. There's always been some hurricanes during hurricane season, but nothing like we've seen now. And it's very interesting to listen to people rationalize this away in, in order they'll they'll ignore what is absolutely um, you would think would be something we can't ignore let me just run through a, a few of the disasters we've seen in the past three or four years the rim fire which burned northern california 402 square miles we had an even bigger fire this year I don't even know the name of it. I've kind of hidden from a lot of this horrible stuff, too. We had the Pony Complex fire in Idaho, 150,000 acres. We had the Funny River fire in uh, Alaska, uh, almost 200,000 acres burned up, 300 square miles. You can't even imagine the size of these fires. The Fort McMill McMurray fire in 2016. 1.5 million acres. Can't even imagine it. It's too large, too huge. We've had Hurricane Harvey, Hurricane Irma, Hurricane Maria. Maria is the one that's destroyed Puerto Rico. Puerto Rico is just barely recovering from all this. We've had the Chetco Bar Fire. In Oregon, I believe it was, 180-some thousand acres. The Rice Ridge Fire, which was in Montana, which was over 100,000 acres burned. We had the Thomas Fire, in, which was at that time the third largest fire. And a whole, I mean, it goes on and on and on and on. We also have this gigantic looming problem of overpopulation where 4 million people are born on the street and die on the street every year in India 18 million people starve to death every year in the world I think we have 9,000 newborns per hour can you imagine that? I can't even imagine that Bangladesh has 146 million people and it's a country the size of Iowa 10 million children starve every year. And the world population grows by 77 million annually. So you hear people say, hey, we have all this space. We don't have an overpopulation problem. You know, we can just keep cranking the population up. You know, people have faulty they, 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 they look at these things uh, incorrectly. For example, if you have a house with uh, 2,000 square feet, let's say, and let's say you give everyone 10 square feet, well, then by that statistic, a 2,000 square foot house, which is a medium-sized house, should be able to house 200 people if you give each one of them 10 square feet. And this is the kind of wrong thinking. Remember, the Meyer material says wrong thinking produces suffering. 
So when you say we can fit all 7 billion people in the world into Texas, into the northern part of Texas, well, we're not taking anything into consideration. Let's say that each one of our 7 billion people gets to eat over a little over one cow in their lifetime. And let's allow two acres per cow, which is about normal, which is healthy. So if you would take 7 billion cows, multiply them by two acres, then you will have 14 billion acres to support the cows for your population of the world, which is now living in Texas. Now, in other words, what I'm saying, when these people quote these silly statistics that say we don't have an overpopulation problem, they're not considering anything. I can tell you that if you have 7 billion people, which we have about 9 billion probably, and you give each one a cow for their whole, that they have to eat over their whole lifetime, which is not a lot of beef, that would be 7 billion cows in the world, which would require 14 billion acres, which is 21 million square miles. 21 additional million square miles to support that 7 billion people that you stuffed in to the northern part of Texas. That would be all the United States, all of Canada, all of Russia, and all of South America. If you're going to allow them to eat beef. So it would take all the square miles in the United States, Canada, Russia, and South America to feed 7 billion people in a world population where everyone gets to eat some beef. Now, <clears throat> how much meat do you get from one cow? Well, a 1,200-pound steer, when it's trimmed and boneless, will give you about 500 pounds of meat. So if each person is assigned a cow for their lifetime, then they will have 500 pounds of beef to eat over the course of 50 to 100 year lifetime. So let's assume that if a person lives 100 years and they eat five pounds of meat per year, they will consume a single cow in their lifetime. However, it's very possible that someone might actually consume, instead of five pounds of beef per year, they might consume two pounds of beef per week and under those kind of conditions, a person might eat as many as 10 cows in a lifetime, depending on just how much food they eat. If you get two pounds of beef times 52 weeks per year times 100 years, uh, that's 10,400 pounds of beef, which is about 20 cows. And I know I've probably lost a lot of folks there. It's hard to hold all those figures in your head. But if you were to turn, see, most of the world is starving now. Um, the world population is, is increasing by 77 million people per year. 10 million children starve every year. We don't see that in the United States. We don't, we're not aware of that. We are the th third fastest growing country in the world because of immigration. I had Frosty Woolridge on the show a while back, and I would love to get him back. Then he can just take over the second hour, as far as I'm concerned, and talk about overpopulation. Uh, he, he, he said something to me that I didn't believe at the time, that, uh, that there is something like 52 lanes of traffic around Beijing, and I believe Beijing has about 14 million people in it, and that's... I think there are only 11 million people in all of Ohio. So Billy describes and says our planet is tormented and slowly destroyed because of overpopulation, because of our atomic explosions that we have set off, because our planet is polluted 
our primal primeval forests are destroyed and let me just explain that the forests moderate our weather they bring shade in the summer which cools the air temperature down in the shaded area go into a thick forest particularly where I live it's 10 20 degrees cooler in the the the, the forest canopy because of the plants so this is very, it moderates the weather. Uh, forests also, because of the trees that grow up into, into the sky, the branches of the trees, they, they call, when the wind blows past those branches, it creates a kind of vortex, for lack of a better word, that helps to form clouds which can then form rain. So, so forests, in that sense, help keep us from having droughts. Now, in, in times of great rain, you, you can have uh, terrible erosion, and the forests, they stop the erosion. In the winter, the forests tend to absorb some of the heat instead of like ice and snow just reflecting it all back so the forests being destroyed is the greatest sadness to me and everywhere I see that um, there's I just don't have any words to really explain how devastating it is so the earth is being polluted and poisoned the primeval forests are being destroyed and annihilated because of our greed. And deforestation is another terrible thing that's happening. The Earth's forests are being cleared on a massive scale. This destroys the quality of the land. Forests still cover about 30% of the world's land area. But giant areas are being lost on the forests every year. So we need to reduce the world's population to about 529 million if we can. Uh, so I was talking about the turbulence that's formed by the treetops. Well, this helps to promote rain. And the forest, pro they promote warmth also in the, in the winter, like I was saying, because they absorb the heat from the light. So deforestation often leaves a patchy landscape or a fragmented forest. And these forest fragments are prone to damage by wind and fire. I planted eight trees in my yard this year. I think I have 35 or something like that. If you can, if you have some land, plant trees. It's critical. Um, very, very critical. Climactic changes are occurring on the planet. We have created a artificial greenhouse, in a sense, which is, I think, is causing extremes of weather and that's what we're seeing a tremendous weather extremes that are going on and the only way we can we have to start to think correctly and and what and Billy's first mentor Spoth said the biggest problem with the earth human is they don't understand what creation is, this, this universe and the universal consciousness. Now, in order to understand what creation is, and I think it's like an infinite topic, so we all would study for the rest of our lives to complete our understanding of the rest of our lives, meaning all of our reincarnations, to just understand creation. But... One of the things about creation to understand is that there's a spirit energy involved with this. And the spirit energy 
is, is in all things. It en enlivens not only humans, animals, microbes, bacteria, viruses, even stones and rocks, sand and water. They have a creational spirit energy. And it's called a Geistin energy. That's a terrible pronunciation. Excuse me for that. That's, that's a terrible pronunciation. But in Figu Bulletin 59, it talks about this spirit energy. And let me read just a little section of the spirit energy here. Every spirit energy which is determined in order to enliven some life form, whereby not only humans, animals, and all creatures, up to microbes, bacteria, and viruses, and so forth, are life forms. So, the bacteria is a life form, obviously. But also so are rocks, stones, sand, and water. This is hard for me to wrap my mind around. Very interesting, though. And so forth, which belong to the vicissitude of the coming, about and passing away is creational spirit energetic and is endowed according to the creational laws with its own intelligence so i'm guessing that means that the rocks the stones the sand and the water have their own intelligence amazing always in accord with the nature of the life form it thereby occurs that these engender an independent intelligence from out of the consciousness through the power of the form of consciousness. And there are different kinds of consciousness. There's instinctive, there's impulsive, there's dynamic. There's um, uh, the consciousness of the human being. Uh, there's something called the collective consciousness block the there's an intelligence um, that many many things have so we have much to learn about what is alive and what is not alive so the spirit energy is something that we all have to learn about now this person that we're talking about edward albert meyer is has a spirit form that's very ancient. He's he's often referred to as Nokodamian. Nokodamian is one of his previous personalities that taught on other worlds under different sets of circumstances. It's called the Universal Prophet. And there are multiple universes, there are many universes. And each universe brings forth this, a universal prophet. So our parallel universe, our sister universe, called the Tao universe, has a universal prophet. And it's a spirit form that reincarnates over and over again, materializing as a human being in order to help speed up the evolution on a planet. And again... Different kinds of living beings have different kinds of evolution. Now, this spirit form that we sometimes call Nokodamian was, it's 9.6 billion years old. It's a fragment of the universal consciousness that lives in Billy Meyer. It can be traced all the way back to a planet called Sadar which existed 3 billion light years from Earth in a galaxy called the Lyran Galaxy, which I think is no longer around anymore. You know, galaxies have a lifetime as well. So one of the things that Nokodamian did is bring rationality to the people in the Lyra and the Vegas star systems. Um... Humanity on the earth did not originate here. We have on every world that produces human life a naturally developing human. But in the ancient past here on the earth, we had extraterrestrial civilizations, not just, not just visits, but civilizations. 
The civilization of Pelagon 150,000 years ago was a civilization headed by a king of wisdom and Ishwish named Pelagon, who was very, very advanced in terms of his material consciousness. If you go back, I believe it is to 289,000 years ago, the people from Lyra Vega were here. And they, they did some things. They committed certain crimes that affected the earth human negatively. And they died on the earth. And they part, became part of the reincarnational patterns of earth. And there was a, a kind of debt they had to pay for these, for these crimes that were committed in the ancient past. Now today... Here on the earth, we are a society that's ill in its consciousness. We don't know who we are anymore. We don't have a collective memory of these events. We have shows like Ancient Aliens and things which are starting to tell some of this story. Nocodamian incarnated on these other worlds in Lyra Vega because the Valyrians and the Vegans uh, started to abuse their power. They had weapons of tremendous intensity. They could take over and destroy entire worlds. A lot of this stuff in Star Wars may be, in fact, impulsed by the Playaren. But I wanted to go over the lineage of the Universal Prophet. Remember we talked at the beginning of the show about the spiritual consciousness versus the material consciousness. So... This spiritual consciousness that's in Edward Albert Meyer right now has been in a man named Nocodamian 9.6 billion years ago, a fellow named Hanok about 8 billion years ago, a person named Semyaza. Uh, I don't know the exact occurrence of when that reincarnation took place. Hanok 13,500 years ago. Hanok II, 9,300 years ago. Hanok III, about four to 5,000 years ago. And then the people in our Bible that we call Elijah, uh, Eliah is probably what he was called because there was no J at that time. Uh, the J really came right around 1550 with Ian Giorgio Tarissino, an Italian scholar who invented the letter J. There was no J in New Testament times or in Old Testament times. For example, the book of Job was originally called the book of IOB. And there was no one named Jesus Christ, believe it or not. That name came later. The first version of the King James, the I think it was the 1611. There were two 1611 versions. The first one that came out, he was called... Lord and Savior, I-E-S-V-S. -S. So it took a while for the name Jesus to slowly evolve. The same with James was actually I-A-M-E-S. John was I-O-H-N. This is one of the most uh, eye-opening and shocking things. The, the letter J came later, right around 1550. The Lyrian language had the letter J. So today we spell the name Emmanuel with a J. Uh, you know, the Lyrians had a just sound. On earth, uh, Julius Caesar wasn't talked about as Julius Caesar. Uh, they would use an I or a Y. That's why if you look at the uh, crucifixion paintings, a lot of times... There was an acronym at the top, I-N-R-A, Iesus, as he was sometimes called, Nazarenus Rex Iodorium. So, anyway, Elijah was Eliah. Isaiah, Jeremiah was not called Jeremiah. Uh, Socrates, Aristotle, Emmanuel, Muhammad, Johann Georg Faust, Galileo Galilei. Mozart, Mendelssohn, Rasputin, and then Billy Meyer. So this is the, all, the, the various incarnations uh, that have occurred in, you know, going back, you know, even before there was an earth. 
six billion years ago, there was a spirit form incarnated on another world called Nocodamia that was teaching the same kind of stuff that we're going over on this show. Now, we here on the Earth will eventually move off the Earth as we reincarnate more and more. Eventually, we will incarnate off of this this wonderful blue planet that we have now. The, the blue planet won't be around long enough for us to fi finish all of our reincarnational cycles. And it will take, oh, um, quite some time for us. It takes 40 to 60 million years, something along those effects, for us to finish our first five stages of incarnation, which again are called primitive life, rational life, intelligent life, real life, life and creational wisdom. That's the fifth stage where human beings become what are called Ishwishes or kings of wisdom. This is uh, the, f the final stage of physical life. That's life and creational wisdom. Now we spend about 56 million years in half spiritual and half material form. This is what's called um, the high council. Sometimes it's called the wavering half spiritual, half material form. We will spend 56 million years in that state. And then finally we merge back with creation. Thanks for listening. This is Ohio Exopolitics. I'm your host, Mark Snyder. Have a great day.